vector relative to point Q cross P. I take the derivative, time derivative, dl dt relative to that point Q. It's always important that you state which point you have chosen relative to which you take the angular momentum. That is going to be dr dt. Excuse me. Cross P plus R of Q cross the PDT. This is the way that you take the time derivative of a cross product. We calculate the angular momentum relative to point Q. So the index has to be Q throughout the equation. The position vector relative to point Q. And in this equation, you see the correct index Q here, you see the correct index Q here, but I slipped up here and I put a C there. There is no C in this problem, so this is also R of Q. Sorry for that. This here is the velocity of the object, the velocity vector, which is always in the same direction as P, so this is zero. The PDT, that is the force on the object, we've seen that before in 801, and so now we have that the LDT relative to a point Q equals the position vector R from that point cross F. And this now is what we call torque. And we write for that the symbol tau. It is a vector. And I put in that Q again. And this is one of the most important equations that will stay with us for at least five lectures. What this is telling you is that if there is a torque on an object, the angular momentum must be changing in time. If there is no torque on the object, angular momentum will be conserved. And now you get some insight into this situation that we just discussed. The force, the attractive force, gravitational force exerted on the earth is in this direction. The position vector is in this direction. So R cross F is zero. There is no torque relative to this point C. Because the angle between the two vectors is 180 degrees and so the sine of the angle is zero. Therefore, no matter where you are on the circle, always R cross F will be zero. There is no torque relative to point C. But if you take point Q or you take here some point A, clearly there is going to be a torque, a changing torque even. And so there you will have a change of angular momentum. So there's something very special about that point C. And I will come back to that, of course. Now I want to expand the idea of angular momentum from one point object that moves in space to an object like a sphere or like a disk which is rotating about its center of mass. And I will start with a disk. Here we have a disk. The disk has mass m and the disk has radius r and at this point c is the center of mass of this disk. It's rotating with angular velocity omega and I want to know what the angular momentum is of this rotating disk. The direction of the angular momentum is going to be trivial. If it's rotating like this, if you take here a little mass element, mass m of i, this is the position vector r of i relative to that point c, and here you have the velocity v of i, then you see immediately that r cross v is coming out of the blackboard, so that's easy. Angular momentum will be in this direction, but what is the magnitude of the disk as a whole? Well, let's first calculate what the angular momentum is of this little mass element about this point. So L of C for mass element I 
equals, or let's just only worry about magnitudes because we already we know the direction. So that is m of i, and then the cross product between r of i and v of i, but this angle is 90 degrees, so I can forget about the sine of theta, so I simply get r of i, v of i. r of i relative to that point c times v of i. This is the magnitude. Now I hate to see a v of i in a rotating disk because the velocity will depend on how far you are away from the center. The velocity here is zero. However, they all have omega in common. Every single element that you choose has the same omega, so I'm always going to replace in a case like this v by omega r. And so this then becomes m of i, r of i of c. I get a square here and I get omega. So I wrote down v equals omega r, which of course holds in general. It would have been better perhaps if I had equals omega times r of i, because each element little i, which has a position, is given by v of i equals omega r of i. But I condense that sort of in one equation, v equals omega r. But this is the connection that will make it perhaps easier for you to understand what follows. So that is the angular momentum for this little mass element. But now I want to know what the entire angular momentum is about that point C, is an axis going through the center of mass, through the center of the disk perpendicular to the blackboard. And now, of course, I have to do the summation of all these elements I. I can bring the omega outside and I would have then the summation of m of i, r of i relative to that point c squared. And you see immediately, I hope that you see immediately, that this is the moment of inertia for a spin around the center of mass through that point c. And so I can write for this i of c times omega. Now comes the question, so this is the magnitude. Now comes the question, is this angular momentum different, for instance, for this point A? And your first reaction will be, yeah, of course, because it depends on the point you choose. Well, the remarkable thing is that if you have a rotation about the center of mass, which I have chosen here, then even if you calculate the angular momentum relative to this point or any other point, even this point in space, you will always find the same answer. But only in case that there is a rotation about the center of mass. And we call that the spin angular momentum. The spin angular momentum is an intrinsic property of an object, regardless of which point you choose relative to which you calculate the angular momentum. So in the case that an object is spinning about its center of mass, you no longer have to specify the point that you have chosen, your point of origin, you can really talk now about the angular momentum. The Earth is spinning about its center. 